Welcome to the Master Plumbers Information Night on the changes to the ASNZS 5601 Part 1 Multi-Layer Pipe Gas Installations webinar. Before we begin, we would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are currently meeting, the Bunurong and Bunwurong people, and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and extend this respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us tonight. I'd also like to pay acknowledgement to President of the Master Plumbers Association, Mr. Norm Anderson. Thanks, Norm. Uh, any other board members, national councillors, or life members in attendance tonight. I'd also like to thank Kiefer Brothers and the Australian Gas Industry Group for their sponsorship for this event. Without companies like Kiefer Brothers and the AGIG, we wouldn't be able to hold sessions like this. It's great to see so many people in the room tonight. And for those of you who are joining us online, thank you very much for being with us. If anyone is in the room and you're not a member, please seek out one of the membership team at the end of the presentation and find out a little bit more about the benefits of being a member of the association. Uh, you may have noticed, but this is a hybrid event, so we do have people online as well. So welcome to everybody who is online and not actually with us here in the room. So we are recording tonight's presentation. Uh, so we're doing that for a couple of reasons. One is just so that we can have a bit of a record of what's being said, but the other is so that we can share the information from tonight's session. For those of you that are online at home, if you do want to participate, uh, please use your icon, your Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, type in your question. We will endeavor to answer as many questions as possible tonight as we go through the presentation. If not, all questions that have been asked and those that are answered will be handed out or presented to everyone that's registered for this evening. Uh, if you would like to, um, at the end of the evening, we'll be having so, uh, some drinks and some, some food. So please make sure you join us for those and have some conversations with people that are around us tonight. Before we do move on, uh, just in relation to a couple of housekeeping items, if you do need any of the toilets, if, as you exit the auditorium, whether you go left or right, there's both male and female toilets that are available. If for any reason there is an evacuation, please follow one of the Master uh, Plumbers member staff. We'll just escort you out of the building uh, to one of the evacuation points. And if you wouldn't mind if you could turn your phones onto silent before we get started. So tonight we'll be hearing from ESV, uh, from our Master Plumbers technical team, uh, from Australia Gas Industry Group, and also from Maxi Troll. And to start us off, uh, Enzo Alfonsetti, who is the Manager of Appliance Safety with ESV, is gonna come up and do his presentation. Thanks, Enzo. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Um, and first of all, thanks to Master Plumbers uh, and Kiefer Brothers for facilitating uh, this event. Um, I've, re I've really been looking forward to, um, to hearing from the other presenters tonight uh, and obviously engaging with uh, the people that are in the room tonight. Um, so a little bit about myself, uh, for those of you that haven't met me before, uh, I'm the head of Type A Gas Appliance and Component Safety at uh, Energy Safe Victoria. Um, I also am the chairman of the Gas Installation Committee, uh, Standards Australia Committee AG6, and I currently chair the Gas Technical Regulators Committee. So. Uh, the Gas Technical Regulators Committee is a committee made up of um, uh, representatives from each jurisdiction in Australia and New Zealand as well, um, and we meet formally twice a year. Um, so my presentation tonight is uh, going to be on the new requirements in the Gas Installation Standard uh, ASNZS 5601 part one, which was published in September last year, uh, but which uh, came into force uh, on the 30th of March of this year. So we had a six month transition period um, for the implementation of the standard. Okay. Um, so a little bit about Energy Safe Victoria to begin with. Uh, we are Victoria's safety regulator for a electricity, gas and pipelines. Um, our role is to ensure the Victorian gas and electricity industries are safe uh, and meet community expectations. And we are also responsible for licensing and registering electricians. 
uh, and educating the community about uh, energy safety. And obviously there's a, uh, a link there to our website. Um, one thing that we do not cover is licensing for gas fitters. Um, that comes under the purview of the Victorian Building Authority and we work very closely with the VBA uh, when it comes to, um, to those uh, uh, matters. So a little bit of an overview of what I'll be uh, talking about tonight. Um, it's predominantly, as you can see, uh, about multi-layer pipe um and the changes in the standard that relate to multi-layer pipe um i'll be talking a bit about the performance base requirements uh that that would apply to multi-layer pipe um uh, prohibition on the location of multi-layer pipe um hot work adjacent to multi-layer pipe um multi-layer pipe uh installations and appliances and uh I think most importantly of all, uh, this is the most significant um, change uh, in my view, is a requirement for fire emergency isolation uh, where multi-layer pipe is installed. So in terms of the performance-based requirements, uh, multi-layer pipe must be suitable for the application and environment uh, where it is installed. Uh, must be installed according to the manufacturer's instructions and be able to be identified. Uh, it must be installed so as not to be damaged and not affected by a building's structural strength and fire resistance. Uh, has to be designed to supply adequate, adequate gas flow without noise or erosion and has to be designed to permit future extensions to existing consumer piping. Now, the reason I'm um, listing these performance-based requirements is because gas fitters have the option, most of the time, that gas fitters will use uh, the means of compliance, which are in sections three to six of the gas installation standard. Um, but there are times where, uh, for whatever reason, a gas fitter might want to use an alternative solution um, that is not prescribed in the means of compliance. And so we have what's called the performance-based requirements in Section 2, and that's essentially where we have these performance-based requirements, as I've just read out to you. Uh, and under those circumstances, you would have to, um, in your application to Energy Safe Victoria, you would have to demonstrate how you would meet the safety outcome if it was different to um, the, the means of compliance uh, way of achieving that safety outcome. So the prohibition on the location of multi-layer pipe. Um, so one of the new requirements is that multi-layer pipe can no longer be installed above ground external to buildings. Um, and one of the main reasons for this is that we have been seeing over a number of years uh, non-compliances in relation to the protection of multi-layer pipe external to buildings above ground. And in particular, uh, with, uh, with regards to UV degradation, um, there was actually some media coverage of this a couple of years ago um, and, uh, and it raised concerns. Um, so an example of what can happen, uh, this photograph was provided to me by the South Australian Technical Regulator, and it, it gives you an indication of what ultraviolet uh, radiation from the sun can do to exposed multi-layer pipe. So within 15 months, you can see there that that multi-layer pipe uh, had degraded uh, as a result of UV. Um, and obviously, you know, people say, well, you know, you can, you can protect it by putting some sleeving around it. Well, this particular installation did have some protective sleeving, um, but the protective sleeving wasn't adequate, right? So, um, you know, it just goes to show that uh, even if you try and protect the the, the multi-layer pipe from damage, in particular UV degradation, um, that that it won't necessarily 
protect the pipe depending on the type of uh, protection that you use. Um, the other thing to consider is that because we're no longer allowing multi-layer pipe to be above ground external to buildings, uh, when you are installing multi-layer pipe, uh, the requirement now is that you must uh, use metallic piping such as copper pipe um, initially if it is external to the building and then that must extend at least one meet, meter into the building before you then transition to multi-layer pipe. Another requirement uh, that we introduced was uh, one in relation to hot work. Uh, so hot work, any hot work, including welding, brazing or annealing of metallic consumer piping must now be done at least one metre from multi-layer pipe, again, to protect the multi-layer piping, including non-metallic joints. Um, so in the old days, you know, um, many gas fitters, what they would do is if they, if they had to do a bit of hot work on some copper piping, uh, and it was connected to some multi-layer piping, uh, they just get a wet rag and, you know, just put that on the, on the copper piping to absorb some of the heat. Um, that, that was a rather crude way of, of trying to mitigate the, the problem. Um, so we actually at Energy Safe Victoria, we actually uh, had some testing uh, undertaken uh, with different lengths of copper pipe connected to, to multi-layer pipe um, and, and, and applied an oxy torch and, 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 and welding and, and, what, and what have you and got uh, uh, the, I think it was the Australian Gas Association, we got to do the, the, the uh, laboratory testing for us um at the time and uh, and measured the uh, the temperature of both the copper pipe and the multi-layer pipe and we were able to determine from that testing that one meter was an acceptable uh distance uh for that type of hot work uh, that would ensure that the multi-layer pipe wouldn't be exposed to excessive temperatures um so i think most importantly is the requirement for um fire emergency isolation where multi-layer pipe is installed moving forward right so for new installations and for modifications to existing installations so this has not been applied retrospectively so uh, i have to make that clear from the start we're not expecting uh for gas fitters to go into an existing home that has multi-layer pipe um and uh, and make all these changes you, you you cannot apply the standard retrospectively um but i'll go into that a little bit more in a moment so one of the reasons why we're introducing automatic automatic isolation of the gas supply in the event of a building fire is that we had um reports from the act uh, they had a New South Wales uh, forensic fire investigator who had attended a number of house fires. And what he determined was that um, in homes that had multi-layer pipe, because multi-layer pipe has a much lower melting temperature than other piping systems, it resulted in um, the multi-layer pipe uh, melting and then the uncontrolled release of gas, which further fueled the fire. Uh, essentially what that did was it reduced the response time for emergency services to get to house fires and put out the fires to um, to mitigate um, or to reduce the amount of property damage and more importantly to to save lives um, so in the slide that I've put up there there are a couple of photos uh, that demonstrate some of the incidents that have occurred so one is of a solar inverter uh, which caught fire and there was multi-layer pipe running adjacent to it and obviously uh, resulted in leakage of the piping system you can see uh, to the left hand bottom corner there some of the damage to the piping um, the picture in the top center there is of some electrical cable uh, adjacent to some multi-layer pipe where there was some arcing occurring, again, resulting in uh, leakage of the multi-layer pipe. Um, the photo uh, in the center bottom there 
is an interesting one. It's actually a transition of copper press fit to multi-layer pipe. Um, and my colleague, David Crew, who's here tonight, um, he was actually at this incident uh, where there was a building fire. Um, from memory, I think it was in a car park. David, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and that actually resulted in an explosion. Uh, and and uh, what uh, there were there was a uh, an injury to a firefighter. Uh, fortunately, uh, it didn't result in hospitalisation. That was just a flash burn. Um, but it could have been far worse. Interestingly enough, what we decided to do is we took that section of, of multi-layer pipe and copper press fit. So we took that, that section of piping away and we had that laboratory tested. And, um, and it was no surprise to us because you could see that the multi-layer pipe had melted. Um, it leaked. Um, the copper press fit did not leak. So again, that's not to say that copper press fit won't leak in a fire because depending on the uh, uh, ferocity of the fire, it will eventually leak as well, but it will be a controlled leak as opposed to multi-layer pipe where if it ruptures, it's an uncontrolled leak and at much lower temperatures. Um, and then the diagram, uh, the sorry, the photo on the right is probably to me the most disturbing of all because I haven't seen this before until recent times. And this came out of New Zealand. Um, so this came out of a media story uh, in New Zealand where supposedly uh, rats had chewed a multi-layer pipe. So what you see there on the right uh, is supposedly the result of uh, a rat chewing into multi-layer pipe, again, resulting in a gas leak. So what do we do about it? So we've introduced into the standard a requirement for uh, where multi-layer pipe is installed that you also have to have a means of uh, being able to automatically shut off the gas supply in the event that the piping is compromised or breached uh, for any one of those reasons uh, that I showed just a moment ago. Um, one of the ways of achieving that is, uh, and this is particularly in large multi-storey buildings or high-rise buildings, uh, is to install a class one uh, safety shutoff valve that conforms to AS4629 and uh, to have that valve installed as close as practicable to the gas supply point to the building. Uh, the valve has to isolate the gas supply when an active fire safety system operates, such as a sprinkler system or a fire alarm. Um, and the system also has to be such that uh, uh, pressure proving is provided before the gas supply is restored downstream. Another solution, um, and uh, in particular in smaller buildings, uh, particularly class 1A residential buildings, uh, is the use of excess flow valves. Uh, which again are installed as close as practical, uh, practicable to the supply point to the building and also prior to any multi-layer pipe within the building. Um, so if installing excess flow valves in a concealed location such as a roof space um, at branch takeoff points, then you do have to give consideration to a, a number of clauses or two clauses in 5601 part one. Uh, so there's clause 5.3.8, which deals with piping in lo uh, concealed locations and clause 5.3.12, which deals with the ventilation of concealed locations where you've got consumer piping running in those locations. Um, the excess flow valves, they will reset when the pressure on both sides of the valve has equalized, but I'll leave it up to uh, Klaus from Maxi Trial to go into further detail about that. Um, and here's a, uh, a picture of a Maxi Trial excess flow valve, uh, and it, uh, also a photo showing a Maxi Trial excess flow valve connected downstream of a gas meter on the outlet of uh, in Victoria, what we would typically uh, term the hockey stick, which runs off the gas meter. 
So a few considerations when using excess flow valves from Energy Safe Victoria's point of view. The valves must be sized to cope with the total gas consumption of all appliances operating downstream. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have nuisance tripping. Um, if the gas meter is sized smaller than the total gas consumption with all appliances operating, then the excess flow valve at the meter may not function because it may be restricted by virtue of the, uh, the flow of the gas meter. So if you have a situation like that, um, I would be contacting the gas company uh, if the gas meter is undersized for that gas installation. Um, the other thing to consider is pressure drops through excess flow valves and through multi-layer piping. Um, you should refer to the manufacturer's installation instructions for the excess flow valves to see what those pressure drops are and also to the pipe sizing tables from the um, manufacturer's instructions for multi-layer pipe. Um, if you're still in doubt, then consult with the multi-layer uh, pipe manufacturer or supplier. Another option to consider is the use of an under pressure shutoff device. So the under pressure shutoff device will isolate the gas supply at a predetermined pressure drop and typically are required to be manually reset. Now, I mentioned before about the standard not being uh, applied retrospectively. So you can't apply these requirements to an existing gas installation. Uh, you can apply it to new gas installations with multi-layer pipe. You can also apply it to modifications to existing installations uh, where multi-layer pipe is used. Um, however, one thing to consider is that if you are working on an existing installation with multi-layer pipe and you are changing a gas appliance over, that is not considered a modification of the consumer piping. And so therefore that does not trigger these new requirements. So if someone asks you to go and change a gas stove over, a, a stove over in a, uh, in a house with multi-layer piping, it does not trigger these new requirements. Um, the other thing to consider that is that fire emergency isolation is not required if you are extending an existing uh, multi-layer pipe installation, but using metallic piping. So if you're using copper pipe as part of a, an extension to a home that has multi-layer pipe, again, that does not trigger these new requirements because it's not considered a modification of the multi-layer piping. Um, on the other hand, if you are extending uh, an existing installation and you are using multi-layer pipe, then you do have to meet the new requirements. We do have frequently asked questions on our website. So if you are interested in having a look at our frequently asked questions that do cover some of the uh, issues that I've raised tonight, um, you can go to our homepage um, and you can see there, hopefully on the slide that uh, we have a link to the uh, ASNZS 5601 changes. If you click on that link and you drill down towards the bottom of the page, you will see another link to frequently asked questions uh, and you will find some frequently asked questions there that relate to multi-layer pipe. Okay, that's it for me. Um, if there's any time for questions or if we want to hold off until later on. Yep. Thanks, Enzo. I'd like to ask Aaron Bridger, Aaron's one of our technical team here at the Master Plumbers. He's just going to go through some exercises around sizing and the use of the excess flow valves. I don't know my presentation off by heart, so sorry, guys. I'm going to have a bit of reading to do. Um, just being mindful of the time, I won't hold you up too long. So we're going to have, be having a look at a couple of... Uh, things around sizing excess flow valves where we're going to put them on a standard installation. Um, I suppose the things that are going to affect you guys out in the field for how you're using them. Um, Enzo sort of covered the why. So 
I'm not going to go too much into that with you guys. Obviously, the clause has been put in place in the new gas standard under the emergency shutoff provisions. That brings us to a standard installation. So this is what one of our um, members actually came to us with asking a few questions about how, where, why, and what to do. Um, I suppose most of us can assume that this would be a pretty standard installation, 30 metre gas run, 2.75 kPa supply pressure uh, and natural gas. Um, and just your standard sort of ducted heater, cooktop, instantaneous hot water service. So the method of sizing that's been used for this is just the sizing guide and, and installation guide for the individual pipe supplier. This one was Gaspex. Um, as you can see, A to B is 32 mil. Then you drop down to 25 for the rest of the main run. And then your branches are in uh, 20 and 16. So again, pretty standard. You guys should all know how to size that. So I don't really want to go into too much depth on that one. Then we look at the uh, excess flow valve selection. And this is probably the first new step for you guys when you um, size these installations and do this work. So according to this, your A to B section, 381 megajoules is your total load. When you look over at your multiple appliances in the sizing chart, and again, that will be specific to the excess flow valve that you use, we need to ensure that the excess flow valve has a greater capacity than what your gas line has. So in this instance, we'd be using a 10 cubic metre valve that gives us an allowance of 392 megajoules and that'll cover off our 381. Step down the next uh, from the next branch B to C at 259 megajoule loading, we're still stuck in that multiple appliance valve at a 10 cubic metre. The next one's where it changes slightly because it's a single appliance carrying on from there at 199 megajoules. So we'll have to move over into the single appliance bracket in the blue, and we're still in a 10 cubic metre valve. B to F off to the ducted heater. They're running a four cubic metre valve for 122 total megajoule loading. So we fall within the range there. And then we're running a 2.5 cubic metre valve to the cooktop. The next stage is going to be understanding what the maximum flow rates through your pipe sizing is. So in this instance, we know our 32 mil pipe has got a maximum megajoule flow of 592 our 25 mil is 294, our 20 is 151, and our 16 is 70 megajoules. Again, that's just taken out of the sizing guide for your piping system. Where that maximum flow rate comes into play is on this slide, because you'll, uh, you are sizing the excess flow valve for the nominal flow and gas flow that you need, but they have a closing flow rate and that changes depending on the valve, again, size, brand, manufacturer. So you need to refer to the specifications that you have. In this instance, it's about 1.45 times the nominal load. On their spec sheets, they will give you a cubic meterage at which the valve closes. For ease and understanding tonight, I've converted that into megajoules. Um, for anyone playing at home, uh, one cubic meter of gas in natural gas equals 38 megajoules. So in this example, if the closing flow rate was 2.5 cubic meters, you would do 2.5 times 38, which would give us 95, give or take. Looking at this, um, the chart on the left, you can see that the 10 cubic meter an hour valve requires 570 megajoules of gas flow in order for that to shut off and isolate. So your 32 mil line provides 592 megajoules, so it will shut it off. Your 25 mil lines, however, will only provide 294 meg. So they won't shut off that 10 cubic meter an hour valve. And likewise, for the four cubic meter an hour valve and the 2.5 cubic meter an hour valve on the branch lines, there won't be enough gas flow through that line in order to shut the valve. The solution 
is to upsize. So as we can see here, the 225 mil lines had to be upsized to 32 mil in order to provide enough gas flow to isolate the valve. The 20 mil line had to go up to 25 and the 16 had to go up to 20 in order to provide enough to shut it off. Move on to the location of the excess flow valves. In this installation, because A to B, B to C and C to E are all 32 mil on the one line, we can put a 10 cubic meter an hour valve at the gas meter. If that line was to burst anywhere along that 32 mil run, we know that the valve will shut off. As you see on B to F, that's where you would locate your four cubic meter an hour valve. And C to G is where we've got our 2.5. Now, if you don't want to go that way, you have a couple of options. The first option you could do is upsize the whole gas installation to 32 mil gas specs or whatever multi-layer piping you're using, which would require you to put one valve at the meter because if that multi-layer pipe bursts anywhere, it will shut that valve off. You could install all branch lines in copper and just run the main in multi-layer with your 10 cubic meter an hour valve. Where you've got the copper off the main, you don't need to protect the copper. You just need to protect the multi-layer installation. You do the whole installation in copper, uh, or you could use another protection method, which uh, Enzo's covered already, being your automatic shutoff valves or upsos. There's just a couple of quick um, important bits of information is that every valve and every pipe manufacturer, their sizing charts vary. So don't just pick one, install something else and assume that it's going to work. You need to understand that there is pressure loss across these valves. So again, whatever valve you use will, be will have a specified pressure loss. So if you come even close to what you think you need for the megajoule loading of the pipeline and you're in doubt, upsize. We're not engineers. You guys aren't engineers. Well, most of you aren't engineers. I won't put everyone in the one box. Um, so don't take the chance. Make sure that the excess flow valve that you select um, is for the correct operating pressure. Now, the upper operating pressure is not really a concern, but in some installations, the lower operating pressure is. So again, look at your individual valve to assess that. We have noted with some of the valves, once they get over particular sizes, they could only be installed in particular orientations. So pay attention to that. And uh, probably the biggest thing is gonna understand the limitation on the fittings, which I think Enzo touched on as well, that when you're installing the threaded connections for the gas lines, they need to be in an accessible and ventilated location. So that's also gonna play a part in where you're putting these things. What I'm going to do now is introduce Michael Llewellyn from the Australian Gas Industry Group to uh, do his presentation. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Brendan. Yeah, first of all, thanks for coming and spending, you know, your precious time and in, in uh, keeping up with what's happening in the gas industry. And um, we're proud to be uh, a sponsor for tonight and uh, being involved in uh, important safety rollout. Um, so I just thought it would take the opportunity to um, give you a little bit of a snapshot on some of the, the work we're doing with digital meters, investigating their suitability for uh, certain applications in the network. Um, so. Um, just we've um, got a couple of uh, digital meters that are, are proving to be quite popular overseas. Um, quite often, uh, these uh, you know, international suppliers come forth with uh, new innovations uh, that uh, we we are interested in. 
so I don't think digital metering will become like the panacea right across our gas networks like uh, it has in, in the, the power networks. But on certain applications, it's going to be potentially a handy thing for us to be able to facilitate uh, for certain properties that uh, opt in to it. So there's a couple of uh, different uh, metering types. Uh, EDMI had one, uh, which is uh, a digital meter, and also Iltron is another manufacturer. So we've, um, we're undertaking some trials of these two different types of uh, digital gas meters in South Australia, and uh, we've got uh, 400 uh, domestic uh, sites which we're we're trialling uh, these meters in Mitchell Park, um, and we've we've started that, and they're going to be running for a twelve month period. And during that trial, we, you know, and so far they've proved to be um, quite dependable. Um, and you know, we we think that uh, <coughs> there's good potential for us to be able to use them, and when the application's right. Um, we believe they they uh, suit the Australian safety and, and accuracy requirements. Um, interestingly, they are ready to uh, service with with gas that's up to twenty percent in hydrogen. And uh, as you may have heard along the grapevine, we've we've already started to do some uh, demonstration projects of of blending hydrogen into um, natural gas networks. And uh, there's more to come in that space. Uh, delivering high performance uh, metering data collection. Uh, so there's there's interval profile uh, information available for customers to tap into, which you know, given certain clients, that could be something that they they really desire. Um, these meters can handle uh, enable uh, key use uh, cases identified in business stakeholders, and the capability. Uh, in these meters to, to send alarms to, to us as, as asset managers um, when they're incorrectly functioning or there's been tampering of the meters. Um, the ultrasonic uh, digital meters are smaller, lighter than the current diaphragm gas meters. The diaphragm gas meters have served a great purpose and will continue to be part of our mix for many years to come. Um, so... Uh, I'll just uh, go to the next uh, next page to say where we think the potential applications might be uh, for customers to opt in. Uh, industrial and commercial customers is an obvious obvious uh, segment. Uh, we're monitoring usage of, of gas in real time is 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 a, a care factor for them. Um, INC and residential customers desiring remote meter reads. Uh, with no special access requirements needed. So that can appeal to some the custom segments as well. Um, some customers want to have a smaller and quieter gas meter. And then there's some developments that uh, desire to have monitoring of, of the gas usage. Aqua um, a green estate to the south, not too far from here or in this area, um, is another example where we've we've managed to service that with a bespoke design of of uh, gas meter assembly. But I'll I'll also um, talk to a little bit uh, towards Enzo's point about the uh, getting the gas meter sizing correct. Um, and I'll just uh, mention I have a colleague here, Steve Walton. You put up your hand, Steve. And uh, if you've got meat, gas metering questions, uh, you can come and talk to Steve afterwards while you're having a drink. Um, and I'll uh, be glad to answer any questions as well. But uh, the sizing, of, in, in talking to Enzo's point about the um, shut-off valves being required in existing installations that have got uh, uh, composite piping involved, um, we'll also need to make sure that the incumbent meter that's there is right, is correctly sized too. So there's enough supply to send through to shut it off. So that means, you know, and I know that's been a potential uh, issue for some plumbers that want to put in a, a, a new ed additional appliance and then sort of move on to the next job. But if it requires 
a UMS or what, what I should say, an upgrade of meter supply. That's what you need to ask for with your gas energy retailer. Um, that's what you need to do because these new valves will potentially need to have that right size meter to make it all happen and keep, keep your customers safe. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and for our last presentation tonight, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Klaus Yeser. So Klaus is uh, with Maxi Troll on behalf of the Kiefer Brothers. So Klaus, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much to Master Plumbers and uh, also the, the sponsors uh, to have me here or to give me the pleasure to say something about excess flow valves. I hope that everybody who has eggs in their pocket, leave it in. Uh, it will be not as bad as you may think about. Um, I'm not a native uh, English, of course. Uh, I'm from Germany. Uh, Max Atroll, uh, I'm Vice President of Global Technology Management within Max Atroll and uh, happy to be here. First time for me in Australia and enjoyed it very much. So I, as I said, have the pleasure to to tell you something about access flow valves and i have to say uh, chapeau because the the speakers before uh, very well prepared very well understood the the theme and i can only add, add something to it uh, maybe some some smaller things details but maybe of help so let's continue of course we have um, our certification we are iso 9001 certified um, I'm talking about OVI, of course, in the EU, and uh, we have notified bodies, as you may aware. And when we have products, we have to use an, uh, or we have to take an accredited notified body who will then test and certify our products. And uh, we, on top of ISO 9001, we have the the gas safety. So that means we have the surveillance of the gas products of our gas controls we produce. Um, which come at least every 18 months and uh, watch us what we do, how we do it, and that we are also able to, to test it accordingly. So of course, the, the VAS, we have uh, the CE uh, approval, which is under the gas, uh, gas pressure, or let's say pressure equipment directive, um, and its standards listed under this directive. Uh, then we have this uh, 5601.1, of course, here in, in Australia. And um, then we have the, the the technical specification, or let's say the code of of uh, of installation of gas insulation in Germany and elsewhere, uh, also in the UK, where we where we also sell those products, and they are also mandatory in Germany and in the UK. And finally, the DIN standard, of course, for those products is uh, the uh, 3652-1. Uh, there is also a dash two, but dash two is uh, for supply lines, so underground. Um, then a little bit about Maxitool. Uh, we are a manufacturer of uh, multifunctional controls. For instance, uh, we have a we have a valve also used for instantaneous water heaters. We have shutoff valves, uh, like the sentry valves here. We are talking about. We have the excess flow valve. But we have also a thermo, thermally activated shutoff device, which will close uh, at uh, 100 degrees C minus 8K. In that range, it will close. Uh, there is a reason for it. Um, also, again, in Europe, it's, it's mandatory in Germany. And also in the UK, we have gas filters, we have gas pressure regulators, um, we have air control system for solid fuel fires. And uh, of course, we have gas outlets. That's a little bit for the commercial part. Now we come to the uh, to the shutoff valves. Uh, we call them Sentry uh, GS, GSH. Uh, the H is for house installation. And when it comes to the ground, we have it E for earth. And um, then you can see we have also thermal cutoff devices. We call them TCO. And we have also a combination of an excess flow valve for the house installation with a thermally activated shutoff device, which is uh, commonly used in the UK. Um, they want to have both, 
because of of uh, ceilings they use uh, plastic what well, not plastic they use rubber ceiling and uh, they say okay if we have a thermally cut off device upstream of it then the valve or the installation will be safe in the case of over temperature by fire or whatever so then the uh, century uh gs uh access flow valve as a cutout here uh, the flow direction is not given but the flow direction will be this way the gas is coming in here going through here so you can see the number one the number one is the valve which is open kept open by the spring against the, uh, the gas flow and we have then an o-ring here in the housing uh where the the uh in in case of overflow the valve will be pushed in against the spring force seals at the o-ring and uh, the housing here is required uh, by the DIN standard has to withstand 650 degrees C, uh, which it does, of course. So external leakage uh, is given. Uh, 650 degrees is above the uh, ignition temperature of methane, and uh, it has to withstand 30 minutes. 30 minutes, uh, the reason is that within 30 minutes, the fire people will be there to cut off the gas line. Uh, then we have up to one inch, we have here this damper function, it's patented, because you have a certain dynamic in the system, uh, for instance, when the service regulator will overshoot, and, uh, and I think this is going down by itself, <laughs> um, it will overshoot and maybe the appliance control, the regulator is in the open position when the valves are closed. So this means you can have a peak, even though it's for a very short time, the access flow valve will identify that and will close. So you have nuisance. And that's why we have this, this damper function for larger pipe sizes, it's, 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 not, it's not an issue, but up to one inch, it can be an issue. And uh, so this dynamic will be uh, compensated by the damper function. So again, with the approvals, I will not go through it. I just mentioned it uh, before. Uh, the registration is uh, CE and then 0085 is the notified body number for the German notified body in the European Union, uh, so-called DVGW. I don't know whether somebody heard about it. It's uh, Deutsche Verein der Gas- und Wasserwirtschaft. That's the German wording. Um, then we have the fuel gases. Of course, we have a standard. It's just in uh, 437 in Germany. It's test gases for appliances, pressures, and so on. Uh, the temperature range is minus 20 to plus 60 degrees C. And the pipe size is, we will come later to it, it's from DN15 up to DN50. That's the normal pipe size you have within a house gas installation, which was already explained also by the colleague. Uh, who had the audience before. So uh, thread connections, of course, is ISO 7-1, should be known, uh, or EN, uh, it's the, the, um, the EN standard, 10226 one uh, There is no difference. The only difference is that in 10226-1, you find also the gauging, which is not mentioned in ISO 6, uh, ISO 7-1. So pressure drops through the valve at nominal flow is half half millibar. This is the lowest you can get. I mean, that's physics and uh, you cannot do less unless you leave the valve out. Then of course, the pressure drops will be not there. Uh, the overflow, overflow volume, we have uh, a bypass uh, in, in the valve, uh, which means that in the case of tripping, there must be a reason for it. There's a damage on the pipe or whatever, you have overflow. It will trip, and once you repair, after a while, it will reopen because of the 30 liter bypass flow through the valve. If you close the ball valve um, upstream and downstream, so the pressure will be equalized. So what else is to say? The, the pressure drop at the maximum closing flow is different as under the nominal flow. Um, when, it, when it trips, it will be 105 uh, Pascal. Um, the installation point, of course, it was also uh, what he said, downstream of the regulator and prior to any multi-layer piping here in Australia and New Zealand. And um, so the pressure is 15 kilopascal 
uh, when you when you test the valve, preferably in the open position. So now you can see uh, the access flow valves we have chosen uh, colored uh, product labeling, where you can see even if you can read what's written on the on the label, you can see by the by the color of the label uh, to which uh, nominal flow the valve is uh, is uh, designed. You have the white, you have the yellow. I mean, it's everything there. And you will find it on the on the valve, uh, so it's easily to identify. Uh, the next page, you can see the the product label itself. So the product label will tell you uh, the flow, the nominal flow of the valve. Of course, then uh, the model. It's an H or a T. The H we are talking about here. The T is a combination with a thermally activated shutoff device. Then we have the operating pressure. Of course, for EU, it's, uh, it's one, 1. 1.5 to 10 kilopascal. And we also uh, have this valve for Australia and New Zealand for 1.25 up to 10 kilopascal. Pipe sizes are mentioned, of course, um, the operating pressure range, uh, the mounting position, of course, because we have the C version. The Z version can be uh, installed uh, horizontal and upward. And we have a D version, which is only for downwards. So that, that's the, the two versions we offer. Uh, as we have seen on the meter band, then you have the D version because it's downward. <clears throat> then the connection gas inlet and outlet, of course, uh, we have uh, male, female, or the other way around. That's, that's possible. Um, the, the, the important also on the label is the errors. That's the direction, uh, which has to be taken, taken care of because if, if it is uh, not installed correct, the valve won't close. Of course, you will have also no nuisance, <laughs> but that's not, not what we want. So again, here we have pipe sizes. I will not repeat this. Uh, also the gas inlet and outlet with the male, female or, or female, male, and uh, the outlet then accordingly. Uh, at, the, at, the, at the right place here, again, the the combination where the, the thermally activated shutoff device is always on the inlet because then the whole thing is uh, is safe when it comes to fire. Uh, a little bit explanation here. I will also not say too much to that. The only thing is, and this question came earlier today, what is SW this year, which is this? This is the wrench size. Uh, you need uh, to tighten and untighten the valve. Everything else is length. L1 is length overall. Yeah. And L2 is the length, uh, which is blank, and then partially for the wrench size. So closing factor, of course, we have a closing factor between 1.3 and 1.45 uh, times nominal flow. Uh, the valves up to one inch uh, get tested with, with, uh, with uh, an elect electric uh, shutoff uh, valve um, with five times. Within one second, it has to close um, and the valve has to stay completely open. Uh, you may think that, or some people think that the valve, when it reaches trip flow, will slowly go to the closed position. Uh, it does not. It stays either completely open or it is completely closed. So there is no, no uh, pressure differential change uh, in, in use. Uh, the K version, of course, the K version is, is uh, for Germany, means Kunststoff, that's plastic. Um, because the, the requirements for those are much, much higher than for metallic piping. As we learned here also with the metallic piping, if you use today, 
we have a certain safety and if we use something else non-metallic or only partially metallic we have to we have to prove that the, it is equivalent to what we use until today um yeah again the d version the c version i explained already uh, the nominal flow rate uh, we also had uh, before uh, we talked about it. Let's skip that one. So this is a, a diagram here where we can see uh, the, the green is the nominal flow of the valve. Um, you have here the different, the different flows, 1.6 where we start with, which is normally for cooked up and up to the GS16 uh, by flow. And you see here, the maximum uh, pressure drop is um, the half millibar. And you can see here what flow you can have with, of course, the density one, which is uh, air. Uh, and, and when it comes to the trip flow, then we are here in the red area for natural gas here. And then, of course, the the uh, the differential pressure will raise up to this hundred and five pascal. So then we have here the tables for the selecting uh, was also already uh, shown earlier. Uh, you have the nominal flow one point. Where have I been here? So natural gas Australia. We have here the different flows on the on the various vari variants. We have the nominal flow uh, depending on the density, uh, kilowatt megajoule, of course, uh, and the the uh, the trip flow. This is equivalent to LP installations. So. Uh, propane butane. This is New Zealand. It's a different situation. I have to take it because I, I don't know. I haven't been there. Maybe next time when I'm here. Um, so butane here. And now we come to this uh, to this picture, which we partially already got also earlier that uh, you have the the main gs uh, and this is a little bit uh, screwed up with with the numbering so the t connector of course is here and not there so that's the main gs to to have uh, the 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 line safe and then you have a, a cooktop where you have a t-piece and then you have a gs which goes to the cooktop and then you have branch lines to the fire the heater, water heater, furnace. And this results in 380 megajoule per hour. Uh, this legend here, excuse me, but that's, that's from, from, from Germany. So PE is the inlet pressure, PA is outlet pressure. It should be PI and PO. I know that. Uh, we have the nominal load, we have the gas meter is Z for CELA in Deutsch. Uh, gas pressure regulator is this uh, pictogram and we have the pictogram for excess flow valves. The ball valves and HRE is the main gas manual shut off valve, which you have where the gas is incoming to the house normally. So then, um, as we said, we come to oh, we come to uh, to a final number of the gas consumption of uh, this three hundred eighty megajoule per hour. And then we have to look, the GS6, as we can see, would not be feasible. The 16 would be too high, and the 10 would be the right one, 392 versus uh, 380 that would do the job. And therefore, you have to choose that, that valve for the, as the main uh, access flow valve in, in the line. So when you have, when you have just a cooker, or cooked up, whatever, uh, which uh, results then in the uh, 38. Of course, you can use the 1.6 version because the 1.6 version was originally made for, for cooked up or for death range.
So now something to read, which is also not new because it was mentioned before. Uh, sizing and selection of essentially uh, GS access flow valves. Uh, they have to be uh, selected by determining the total nominal load. I don't repeat it. We heard it already. The recalculation for safe uh, function of the FE in case of an emergency. It is necessary to determine the pressure drop um, of the system at maximum, maximum uh, closing flow of the EFE, which I mentioned earlier. And uh, then I cited from the Australian standard um, what that says. And of course, important is that we want to um, to mention that the, the, the flow through the meter should be not less than the trip flow of an access flow valve, because otherwise it would be in contradiction and it, it wouldn't work. Uh, having said this, before installation, of course, it was also said, uh, compare the actual center GS with the, with the plant type that this matches, because otherwise you run into trouble. Uh, I also want to mention here, just a, a hint for myself, that once you have done the installation, um, and, and I mean, the goal of protection is that the open end of the pipe that, that, that the valve will trip. So just open the end of the valve where normally the appliance is hooked up to it and see whether it will trip or not. I mean, then, then you know whether everything was correct or not. That's easy, at least to start with. I mean, later on, uh, we had the same things when we started in Germany and elsewhere. Uh, people said, oh, we did everything so wrong and everything was fine. And now we get an uh, additional uh, control or valve, which costs more money, of course. It creates a pressure drop, blah, blah, blah. But at the end, after, after some time, it became a normality and no one is asking anymore about that. So, yeah, just make yourself familiar with those products. Uh, it's, really, it's really a safety measure, affordable safety measure. So... Um, again, I can only repeat that always the, the mounting position on the label with the arrows is very important because otherwise you have no function on the valve. Um, the reopening, of course, is done. You don't have to repair or you have to exchange the valve. That's why we have the bypass with the 30 liter bypass flow. If you close the valve uh, upstream, downstream, of course, you have to repair why, or you have to take care why the, why the valve tripped in the first place, and then uh, the valve will reopen by itself. It's really easy. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, this is only to show um, where you can have access rovers. I mean, these, these are, this is the, the, the main uh, gas line in the street. Then you have uh, an electric fusion socket in this case, and we have we bring our access flow. We don't produce those sockets, but we bring our our valve in. We get it from the manufacturer. We do this. We do the testing. We send it back to the manufacturer, and then because we had four thousand uh, uh, four thousand damages in in the nineties per year uh, by people excavating uh, the the ground. Uh, today is even easier because they can rent those small diggers <laughs> and uh, they, there's, there's even more chance that they damage the pipe. And therefore, uh, by doing that, this is safe. And then in here, you have then the excess flow valves. It's for one of two family houses in Germany enough. If you have multi-dwellings, more than two families, then you have it uh, upstream of each meter so that each apartment is... Uh, is safe when it comes to damages. Yeah, then some more products I will not tell too much because I was also said, are they certified uh, in Australia? And no, they are not because I think there are no standards. <laughs> um, so we have we have the thermally activated cutoff device, as I mentioned before, small sizes, bigger sizes. And we have also a combination of a ball valve with a, with a TCO. The thermal cutoff. 
And uh, that was my presentation. I hope you enjoyed a little bit uh, and that I could also convey some information over to you. And uh, yeah, thank you very much.